Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center and a recovering politician. Some of you are in earlier time zones, but many of you are in our nation's capital as I am. Uh, this is an, a joint event between the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute and our friends at the Migration Policy Institute called MPI. Discussions like today's are the reason the Wilson Center, a lot of bragging about us, has been voted three years in a row as the number one think tank in the world for regional policy studies and for regional cooperation. Uh, We've had over 1,200 RSVPs for this event. That breaks all records at the center and maybe at MPI as well. And it demonstrates the importance of the US-Mexico border as well as the fact that our audience wants to hear the congressional perspective on this issue. And we're very excited that two members of Congress are joining us. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I served in Congress for nine terms from Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a majority minority city, uh, fairly close to Mexico, and a huge number of residents of Los Angeles are of Mexican and Central American origin. It's important to me, it always has been important more than ever now, that we understand the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico, which both of us at the U.S.-Mexico border. The Wilson Center has been following the impact of recent border restrictions since the U.S. imposed them a few weeks ago in coordination with the Mexican government. Today, we are excited to host a conversation with Veronica Escobar and Dan Crenshaw, two newly minted members of Congress from Texas who bring enormously valuable experience in immigration and national security. Uh, Congresswoman Escobar is the first woman elected to represent Texas's 16th district, covering El Paso right across the border with Mexico. A Democrat, she is a member of the Armed Services and Judiciary Committees and delivered the Spanish language response to the President's State of the Union address earlier this year. Before serving in Congress, she served as El Paso County Commissioner and County Judge. She also joined a panel that I chaired uh, in Munich at the Munich Security Conference in February and was enormously impressive. That seems so long ago. We lived in a different world then. Um, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, a Republican, represents Texas's second district, located around Houston. A Navy SEAL for 10 years with five tours of duty, he is one of 19 veterans in the freshman class, the largest number in a decade. And it is a huge deal that we have so many uh, who served our country uh, now serving in Congress. Thank you, Dan, for your service. Uh, he, his experience obviously informs his role on the Homeland Security Committee, and he's also a member of the House Budget Committee. Again, thanks to you both for joining. Uh, the Wilson Center is nonpartisan, and I'm always thrilled when our conversation can be bipartisan. Let me just point out that our, uh, our late chairman, Fred Malik, a passionate Republican, always pointed out that the most important thing he supported could do was to put the country, and I just spirit mentioned that to you again for your service. Station is a dear friend of the Wilson Center who served with, among us, for many, many years, first as founder 17 years ago, you wouldn't believe that, but it's true, of our Mexico Institute, then as vice president for programs, and finally in his last years as executive vice president. Uh, my principal, and Andrew and I full place and uh, his family is part of the Wilson family and I send special love to his daughter Lucia uh, and I miss her very much please tell her I said so um, among many other uh, achievements uh, Andrew has been a co-director of the regional migration study group an MPI Wilson Center collaboration that looks at regional migration flows among the Central American countries Mexico and the United States his insights on immigration policy over decades have laid the conceptual foundation 
for reform efforts in recent uh, And through MPI's Independent Task Force on Immigration and America's Future, uh, we're all learning a lot. So Andrew, thank you for your long service at the Wilson Center. Thank you for your very uh, uh, important leadership at NPI. And thank you for this collaboration. I will now turn the program over to uh, my former colleague and friend, Andrew Seeley. Thank you, Jane. Um, wonderful to be with you again. Great to see you. Um, and, and I still feel part of the Wilson family. Thank you for, for that. Um, and, and it's great to see you again. I will definitely pass on your, uh, your greetings to Lucia, who speaks of you often and fondly. Duncan, uh, thank you so much for putting this together with us, and Chris Wilson, and you'll hear from Duncan Wood, the director of the Mexico Institute. Um, we've had a long collaboration, as Jane said, between Migration Policy Institute and the Wilson Center. I used to be on the other side of it, now I'm on the MPI side. Like Wilson Center, we are nonpartisan, and we try and, and think about how, in a very complicated set of issues, we can reach conclusions that people on both sides of the aisle um, and around the world in, in different political positions can understand and agree with. Um, immigration is one of those issues that matters enormously to all of us, and we care particularly about the U.S.-Mexico border, as does the Mexico Institute at the Wilson Center. Um, great to be here with the two members of Congress, uh, Congresswoman. Um, great to see you again. Uh, good chance to know you for quite a while since you came to Congress. And Carson Crenshaw saw you last year actually at a, a small event at AEI, and, and great to, to actually meet you here. Um, during this call, we are going to we're going to let the two members of Congress speak. I'm going to leave them through a few questions. If you have questions and you want to jump into the discussion, um, you can either uh, write to Mexico at WilsonCenter.org, or you can tweet by tagging at Mexico Institute, and we will try and, and ask as many questions as we can to the members of Congress at the end here. Um, you may want to visit the website of the Wilson Center Mexico Institute, www.wilsoncenter.org slash Mexico for information on the border, or the MPI website, migrationpolicy.org, and we have a special COVID section as well in our website. Um, let us start with, uh, with Congresswoman Escobar, who is at the border, not, not at this very moment because you're in Washington, I realize, but just came from the border. Um, how, what is it like at the border right now in the middle of the COVID-19 epidemic? And what does it look like crossing the border? What does it look like in the city? Give us a little bit of the, the flavor of how the border feels right now. Well, first, Andrew, it's really wonderful to see you. And I, I want to thank Jane and, and everyone at the Wilson Center and at, at MPI for hosting this conversation. Uh, thanks to everybody who's tuned in and who's participating. I'm so happy to hear that there are so many folks who are interested in what's happening at the US-Mexico border. And, and I think the way that you all opened up the conversation is really important. We have to have thoughtful uh, discussions that are, in my view, you know, led by facts and by truth. And the border frequently is portrayed in a very one-dimensional way. Um, and it's a very complex, wonderful, magical place. I feel very fortunate to live there, to, to be a third generation fronteriza, um, and very privileged to be able to represent the, the, the border community of El Paso, Texas. So your question, how are we doing? Um, you know, in many respects, El Paso is, and I'm, I'm sure the rest of the border is, is seeing exactly what many other communities across the country are seeing. Our streets are empty, um, our, our small businesses, large businesses, all but essential businesses are closed. It is so um, heartbreaking to, to, you know, on my drive to the airport this morning, early this morning, there's this post-apocalyptic feel. Um, but our ports, El Paso is, is different from other communities in the complexity that, that the border has. You know, the Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, Texas, really are one community, we're one region. Um, in many respects, there is a fluidity between the two communities because of trade, because of family ties. We share our air, we share our water, we share our history, our language, our culture, our traditions. Um, and we're very used to going back and forth and, and we see that as an asset and a good thing. During times of great crisis, we come together uh, and that's been uh, part of who we are. And, and El Paso and Ciudad Juarez have seen some tremendous challenges, whether it, it, it's been um, you know, the, the large number of migrants seeking refuge at our front door, whether it was the horrific shooting last August, uh, where we were targeted because we are a migrant and Latino community, or whether it's the pandemic. 
And as you all know, a, a, a pandemic of this nature doesn't see borders, doesn't observe borders, um, but we have seen a tremendous slowdown in border traffic. And a, a, you know, a part of that is, has been imposed by the United States for the, for, you know, and, and I support this. I support the, the, the stay at home orders. I think we have to be very cautious. We have to make sure that we, we uh, protect ourselves and our families. It has had a huge impact on our local government budgets. Um, which rely on cross-border trade, which rely on sales tax receipts and that connectivity that, that we love. We've had 587 cases confirmed of COVID-19. We've had nine deaths in El Paso. And Ciudad Juarez, uh, which unfortunately the state of Chihuahua, like the state of Texas, has been um, behind on the testing. Texas, I believe, uh, either is near the bottom or at the very bottom when it comes to testing per capita. So the numbers are probably far greater than what's being reported. Um, and so I, don't, I believe we probably don't have an adequate idea of just how many cases and how many deaths we've really had. Add to that, we have Fort Bliss, which is a tremendous national asset and community asset. Those cases of COVID-19 are not being reported along with the city cases. So again, um, you know, they're being reported to me, they're being reported to the city. So th those of us uh, in leadership locally know what the, 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 the number is on base. But again, I feel like there are larger numbers, but um, I'm looking forward to the conversation because border communities are key to the economic lifeline of our state in Texas, uh, key to the economic lifeline of the, the nation. And it's the, you know, Mexico's an important neighbor. And so thank you for hosting us. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, turning to uh, Representative Crenshaw, um, you're not right at the border, but you are right in the heart of the state that has the closest economic relationship with Mexico, and you serve on the Homeland Security Committee, um, and you know the importance of the relationship between the two countries. How are you seeing the pandemic highlighting the connections between the U.S. and Mexico? What's working? What's not working? What opportunities do you see going forward between the two countries? Congressman. Well, uh, I'll, I'll key off of um, what Representative Escobar said in, in the last part of, of her answer, which was um, Mexico is a key ally, always will be. Uh, there's there's a lot of American interest, and I think there should be more interest in a, a foreign policy that really builds up our American neighbors, North and South. Uh, that would be, this is especially important considering how we all seek to delink ourselves from Chinese supply chains and uh, I, I think seek to bolster production in places like Mexico. Now there's impediments to doing that. Uh, the Mexican government under AMLO is, um, it hasn't been as friendly to foreign direct investment as maybe we would like. The energy, um, the, the potential for, for nationalization of energy resources being some indication of that. But let's work with them. Let's work with them on security. You know, what is holding Mexico back? What is one thing? It is security. It is the fact that drug lords, uh, um, control vast swaths of this country. I would. We need to help more with that. Now, again, part of that is the Mexican government doesn't want us to. Let's keep trying. Uh, we, we we have to do this. This is this is our neighbor. There's a huge interconnectedness here. Uh, Texan culture, Mexican culture, deeply intertwined. Uh, this this is why so I've worked with Democrats like Tor like Representative Torres Small on improving our non-intrusive inspection technology at the border. Let's improve our commerce. Okay, let's keep this going. Okay, that, that's all aside from the COVID-19 thing, um, obviously. Uh, but, but, those, but those are all still true. So how has COVID-19 affected everything that we're doing right now? Well, in the most obvious way possible, right? There's, there's obviously a limiting of, 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 of simple human travel between Mexico and the United States, just like there's a limiting of human travel literally everywhere across the world, within our own country, within our own, within our own neighborhoods. Uh, so that has obvious economic consequences that um, we're, we're, we're dealing with, and uh, we all know why those are happening, and, and, we ex and we hoping and expecting that to, to, um, to, to, to change, hopefully in the near future, as, as we come out of this crisis. How is Texas doing? Um, you know, I, Texas is, as related to the rest of the country, is doing extremely well. One of the reasons we have lower testing per capita is because the federal government diverts testing from Texas. Why do they do that? Because we just we don't have nearly the cases that other 
that other uh, states are having. It's difficult to ascertain how many cases exactly we have, just as it's difficult to ascertain throughout the world um, until we literally tested everybody for antibodies. But we do know hospitalization rates. Um, that, that we can check on a daily basis. And Texas has a, a, has a very robust healthcare system and hospital capacity. And I'm coming from Houston, I can definitely say that with the Texas Medical Center. We have very low rates of hospitalization right now. So we're doing well. Um, our hospitals also prepared for this a long time ago. I asked them how they're doing on PPE. They say, well, back in January, we decided to order more because we saw this coming. Begs the question why other hospitals around the country don't do that. Um, but uh, Texans maybe are a little bit more used to disasters, especially in Houston. Uh, so we were, we were prepared and I'm, I'm pretty proud of how we're going forward. Our, our governor is now looking at a staged reopening over the next few weeks that I think is, is moderated and responsible and, and going in the right direction. So um, I, I'm optimistic um, on, with, with Texas and, um, and getting the border uh, and our economic trade uh, back to normal sooner than later. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congresswoman, do you want to? You, you mentioned also how important the interconnectedness was for El Paso and Texas. You want to talk about how does this change with COVID? Do you see it opening up again in the future, or is this going to be an ongoing question that worries you as in, in El Paso in terms of the relationship there? Yeah, you know, I, I am really concerned. I, along with everyone, I, I don't think there's anybody in, in this country who isn't eager to reopen up our economy reopen, business uh, in, in my community reopen, uh, the maquiladoras, you know, we, we've gotten notice, for example, from our business community about some of the uh, maquilas in, in Juarez and in Mexico, further into Mexico, that are linked to our automotive industry, our aviation industry, two industries that are critical to Texas economy. Um, and that those plants have been shut down um, because of COVID-19 outbreaks. Um, you know, I, the key, I believe, and, and I, I get this information from uh, experts, uh, and, and I, I believe the experts, I, I, I think we need more testing. And we, what's happening in communities like mine and communities all over the country where there isn't robust testing is that essentially the testing's being sort of rationed. So I'm still getting calls from constituents, for example, who say that regardless of being symptomatic, they're not being tested because there's just not enough tests. The same is true in Mexico. And um, in fact, there was a whistleblower supervisor in one of the maquilas uh, who just died in El Paso and he was sounding the alarm about uh, the lack of transparency and the lack of testing and, and his concerns uh, about groups still you know, being close together and working. Um, and so I think we've got to make sure the economy is, is critical. Again, you know, I am really deeply concerned about my local economy. My city, the city of El Paso is, is taking significant hits. So is the county of El Paso. I know the state is as well but we've got to get this right. You know, everyone keeps warning us about a resurgence in COVID-19 that could hit us even um, harder in the fall. And so we've, we've got to follow the science. We've got to make sure that in terms of the testing, we err on the side of caution. Um, you know, I, I, I find it challenging and worrisome when I hear um, some folks talk about how uh, we can start to reopen economies without that robust testing. And so I would advocate for, and that's part of why I'm supporting uh, tomorrow's vote, uh, because it includes $25 billion, the, this supplemental that we're voting on tomorrow here in DC for testing. And it includes a, a requirement for a national plan for testing. Uh, Congressman, do you want to respond to any of that? And, and also, how do you see, I mean, it looks like commerce is continuing between Mexico and the U.S. So that the, the, the movement of people has been limited, but actually the trade relationship is largely carried on with obviously some of the hits that we've taken in both economies. Yeah, of course. I mean, listen, nobody disagrees we need more testing. The, the problem with this narrative is that there's this sort of, it's, a, it's as if we're telling people that if you get more testing, it somehow stops the spread. None of that is true. Um, you know, you have to question if somebody with symptoms and is staying at home, what is the actual purpose of that test? 
The purpose of that test would be to collect data. That's important, that's fine, but it certainly doesn't stop the spread. The emphasis needs to be on sampleized testing. Okay, and so how can we do this? We've been talking about this a lot in Harris County and how to, how to, how to do this moving forward. The way this needs to work, it, it, it's fine that you can, you know, you, we have these public testing sites. You get 500 people through there a day. Guess what? They're not even getting to capacity. Can you realize that? Texans don't even need, they're not even looking to get tested in Houston. They're not even reaching that limit. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that either they don't have symptoms or they already know they're staying at home. And even if they feel sick, what's the point? Right? And even if you're getting to the hospital, well, you're going to get care. But there, we should ask an intellectual question here. What is the point of this test? The point of testing is to be able to conduct contact tracing to suppress further outbreaks. Now that we've established what testing can actually do, now maybe we know a better strategy to, to, to inform our policymaking decisions. And the way we've been talking about this in Harris County is it needs to be a public-private partnership. Okay, that's how you do sampleized testing. If you have a, a, a company or a factory with a lot of people crammed in there together, let's sample test a few workers there per week. That would be an example of a good strategy to make sure that we're identifying outbreaks early. Um, you know, and that, that's how the new normal, I think, looks going forward. And, um, and, and the administration has been working day and night on, on how to improve our supply chains for testing and how to increase manufacturing. Um, the, the, the notion that they can just flip a switch and decide to have more tests, of course, has, has always been false, even though that's been often perpetuated. Um, but, but of course, we all agree we need, we, we would like to get a certain, we could like to get at a certain rate of testing. Um, the, um, what was the other part of your question? Or did I, did I just answer it all? In relationship with Mexico, which, which is continuing in the middle of this, but obviously with both economies hurting. Yeah, well, I, I think we just done the last one. Um, cl clearly, that is what's hurting the, the trade. It's, it's, it's a combination of COVID-19 and the fact that everybody's staying at home and therefore not consuming and therefore general economic consequences of that are, are obvious. Moving to immigration, a contentious topic, um, but an important one. Um, there has been, the administration has moved to uh, return people quickly to the other side of the border. Um, they are, uh, there's obviously a tension between protecting immigrants, protecting CBP agents, giving people access to the asylum system. Um, you know, how is, love both of you to weigh in on how you see this as being handled. Um, and we'll go and talk about MPP specifically in a minute, but, but the, the rapid return of immigrants to the other side of the border, how's that playing out? Representative Escobar. Uh, yeah, well, you know, that's obviously happening um, shockingly uh, in the United States and it's happening in my community. And I think one of the things that I hope we get from this conversation, uh, this bipartisan conversation with, um, you know, people who truly, I think, mean well and want to get to a solution. I hope we abandon things like, you know, call, uh, calling a perspective a narrative. I want to tell my colleague, Representative Crenshaw, I'm not repeating any narrative. I'm, I'm bringing to the table into this conversation my own experience in my community. So um, I, think, I think this is a great conversation to have. And I think let's trust that, um, that each person is bringing to the table uh, true you know, experiences and ideas and policy perspectives. So let me tell you what's happening in El Paso, Texas with the, the rapid returns, the, the folks that are, that are being sent back very quickly. Um, so, you know, migration is still happening. Um, folks are still arriving at our front door looking to seek asylum, um, looking to be reunited with family. There is uh, no processing happening right now, and it hasn't been happening for a couple of weeks. Um, and so the Border Patrol agents are coming um, into contact apprehending migrants, and migrants are being returned very quickly, sometimes within an hour. Um, also, you know, I've heard like a max of 90 minutes. Um, many of those folks are not abandoning their effort to come into the United States. So, you know, they are coming back over and over. We've, we've gotten reports that, that they are coming back and trying to reenter five to six times. What does that mean? That means that when they're, when they're returned back uh, very quickly without processing, they then become targets because of their desperation. They're becoming 
uh, we're, the, the U.S. through this policy is essentially creating a new set of circumstances for the cartels to take advantage of. The cartels and human traffickers saying, you know, I'll take you to another part of the border if you'll pay me X amount. And, and th these folks, it, we're basically creating a revolving door. That means that as, as uh, migrants are apprehended and then sent back, they are coming into contact with more and more people. Then they are coming into contact with our agents five to six additional times. That is not helping prevent the spread of COVID-19. I think it's really important that we work together, that, that we show, we demonstrate strategic, collaborative, um, comprehensive, and compassionate leadership and work with all countries. I mean, we should have been doing this um, going back three years ago. Um, it, you know, there's been collaboration and cooperation, but not in any meaningful way to address root problems. So without addressing the root problems of migration, we're just going to keep seeing it over and over and over again. And indeed, in many ways, it becomes a different kind of crisis. In this case, it's a healthcare crisis, and it puts at risk not just the migrants, but it puts at risk our CBP agents, our Border Patrol agents, our OFO agents, our, the lawyers who are seeking to represent and help these, these migrants, the advocates, um, the faith-based leaders. It puts everybody at much greater risk. And so I think it's, uh, it's a, a failed approach, a, a more dangerous approach. And you, Congressman Crenshaw, how do you see this? Yeah, I mean, the CDC is acting under authorities, 42 uh, U.S. Code 265, which is suspension of entries and imports from designated places to prevent spread of communicable diseases. That, um, that seems like common sense, and I think that's what's happening right now. Um, you know, I, I, I disagree with a couple of things here. The... the the reality is that the cartels have long had control over our border. I have never spoken with a with a border patrol agent who says otherwise. It is well known that that people crossing um, pay some kind of toll to the cartels. That hasn't changed. The COVID nineteen situation hasn't changed. That that's long been the case. This goes back to the security argument. I mean, I agree with what Representative Escobar says about rooting out the the actual sources of illegal immigration. Uh, and those sources are namely security and economic opportunity uh, everywhere south of the border, uh, whether that's in Central America or Mexico. None of that, but, but just because we agree that there's a root problem that, that I think America does have a role in solving, and, um, and that's very bipartisan. We've actually passed legislation um, within the last year that, that attempts to address that in a more creative way. But none of that means that we don't enforce the laws that we have here. Um, especially uh, when, when we have a pandemic ongoing and we are restricting movement within our, within our country, um, but, but we can't then make the argument that we should unrestrict movement between our borders. Um, I, I fail to see the, the logic there. And so I, you know, I, I fail to see how there would be less of a public health concern by, by, by allowing immigrants to come across the border and then inevitably releasing them into the population because our, our system has long been so overwhelmed. That's often what happens. Um, the MPP program has changed that to a large extent. Uh, DHS policies have changed that to a large extent. And so um, that it has improved over time. Um, you know, this is, this is again, putting aside the COVID-19 epidemic um, that the, the, the number of crossings has improved over time because of these policies. And um, I, I, I simply don't see a downside to that. Okay, and, and Congressman, anything you want to respond on that? I also wanted to move on to MPP, the, Mi the Migrant Protection Protocol, Remain in Mexico, sometimes called in the press, the, um, the policy of having migrants from other countries wait in Mexico for their U.S. immigration hearings. You've been very vocal about that. Do you see that as a risk at this moment? I mean, particularly with COVID-19 or... You know, where, how do you see this developing at this point? And then Representative Crenshaw will weigh in a minute as well. You know, I, I want to be part of a government that actually solves problems. I want to live in a country that leads in thinking through ways to address our biggest challenges in a way that embraces and fulfills our values. And um, I just want to say as a footnote, um, my comments about the cartels 
um, I agree that the cartels have always played a role. My point was, was that we keep giving them new customers in, in the policies that, uh, that the administration is implementing uh, at the ports of entry. And um, if we had enough tests, and I agree about the testing as well, the, 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 but the, the idea that you diminish testing by saying it doesn't, um, it doesn't cure COVID or doesn't prevent the disease, we all know that. That's not the point. The point is testing is the first step, a key critical step of, of solving the great challenge of being able to, to do the contact tracing, to do the isolating, the quarantining, so that we are able to maintain um, our, our uh, ability to provide health care and access to ICU and uh, ventilators, et cetera, for the, the folks who really need it. If we had enough tests, we could be testing the folks who are in our custody. We don't even have enough tests to test our own agents. Our, the agents in, in, who work for the federal government are being tested by the localities, um, and that's who they're relying on. And um, I'm in, in constant contact with uh, all of our federal agencies among many other stakeholders. So if we had enough tests, we'd be able to adequately, adequately determine those um, uh, asylum seekers in MPP, for example, who have been living for months in squalid conditions in Mexico, um, some sleeping on church floors, some uh, sleeping in um, makeshift shanty towns like in, in Matamoros, those tent cities that are just terrible and inhumane, or in Ciudad Juarez, there are some shelters. Um, those are folks awaiting their trial. They are part of the legal asylum system in America. And they are, for the first time ever, our country is sending them to await their hearing in another country, a different country. So the, the, the MPP and so many of these policies are a complete erosion of our, even our legal asylum system. But without testing, if we had adequate testing, we would be able to test those folks, be able to reunite them with their sponsors. The vast majority of these individuals awaiting their hearing have sponsors. And this is per the federal government's own data. Upwards of 85% uh, of them have sponsors. They could then shelter in place safely and securely um, awaiting their asylum hearing. We know the vast majority of them, contrary to what's been said before by other folks, um, that th they show up to their asylum hearings. Um, and so we, what we've created though, again, the, the, the United States under this administration, my concern is we've created uh, conditions that put everyone at grave risk unnecessarily. And so the, the lawyers who still have to go across the border into another country to meet with their clients, they are put at risk. The advocates who do that, they are put at risk. For um, a significant period of time, the federal government, um, its immigration courts were not following CDC guidelines um, until very, very recently, putting all of those staff members and all of the folks involved in that court system also at risk. Um, and so, you know, the, if we don't handle this and address these challenges and live up to these challenges, um, with, the, with treating people with dignity and following the law and adequately addressing this challenge, it quickly becomes a crisis. That's what we have now uh, with MPP. The, the, per the policies, the administration's policies, there's no MPP hearings now. And so what's happening with the migrants in, in the shelters in Ciudad Juarez is they are required to go to the port of entry, all of them, their entire family, they have to go to the port of entry in order to show all their documents in order to request a brand new hearing. So it puts that entire family at risk, puts the agents greeting them at the ports at risk. And in addition to that, when they get back to the shelter, in some cases, shelters have been closed, leaving them completely homeless, or they've lost their place in the shelter because it's been provided to somebody else. All of this at the hands of the uh, American government.
Thank you, Congresswoman. Congressman Crenshaw, how do you see this? You've been more of a supporter of MPP. How do you see this playing out right now? Yeah, huge supporter. Let's, let's talk about what MPP actually is. Anybody who is coming in who is not from Mexico, but is passing through Mexico, where they cross, they, they returned to Mexico to await their hearing. These hearings are not being denied right now. They're being delayed and because we're in a COVID-19 pandemic. And that's, that's what it is. Okay, they're not being, we can't make this sound like they're being just flown out to some other country. This is the country they literally just came from. And then they crossed our border illegally. Okay, they didn't, these are, these are, these are the people who were trying to cut the line. And so I think we just disagree on a very fundamental issue here, which is some sense of, well, some semblance of rule of law and some semblance of order. We have a system for a reason. It is clearly the case that the vast majority of these people do not have a valid asylum claim. From the Department of Justice, the numbers are about 12 out of 100 end up being granted. Why? Because asylum has to mean something. It can't just mean that, that, there's, that, there's, that, that, that you have um, economic distress back home or, that, or that even that there's security concerns back home. Asylum actually means something, some kind of, of particular oppression against a group of people. It's very well defined. And the vast majority of immigrants claiming it very well know that they don't actually meet the criteria. And so that, that is just a truth that we have to deal with and that there are, there, there are limited resources in order to process people into the country and that we have to have some kind of value over our sovereignty as a country. It really is a simple, a simple question of what kind of order can we implement at our own border. And that, that's where the MPP comes from because without the MPP, what was happening? Well, people, could, people had an incentive to illegally cross the border because they knew, and especially if they brought a child with them, they knew that they would be processed and our legal system made it very difficult for us to actually return them back to their home or deport them, even if they had no claim whatsoever. They knew that they would probably be released. That's why you hear this term catch and release over and over again, it's been going on for years. They knew that, and so there was a huge incentive to cross the border illegally in large groups. And by the way, the cartel makes a lot of money off of those large groups. Okay, so the MPP program switched up that incentive. Now, people realize, well, there's a, there's a decent chance, not a 100% chance, but there's a decent chance that they'll be told to just simply wait their claim. They're not being denied a claim. They're just told to wait it out and see what the merits are of it in the country that they were just in a few minutes ago, okay, that they're not being persecuted in. There is no indication that, that, that the Mexican government is persecuting anybody, okay? And, and, if, and if the Mexican government is oppressive and everybody there deserves some kind of asylum, well, then by that logic, every single citizen in Mexico deserves to be a U.S. citizen all of a sudden. But that's obviously not the case, is it? So the, the, the logic just doesn't compute. It does not make sense. I understand the compassionate reasoning here. But we also have to, to, to weigh that against our, our simple capacity to deal with immigration and our simple and, and the standards that we ourselves have set forth into law about what asylum means and about and about what we can accept as a country as far as as, as far as immigration goes. Representative Escobar, I mean, the, the polls tell us that Americans are sympathetic to immigration, but they also do want law and order, right? They do want to know rule of law is being followed, as Representative Crenshaw raised. How do you do that at the border without MPP, or what? What would you approach this? I think the important thing when we're talking about rule of law and um, adhering to the sanctity of rule of law, it's a two-way street. We can't just say we expect other people to adhere to the law, yet as a government, we can completely violate it and ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. Either the rule of law means something or it doesn't. Um, you know, there are two other words that are really important to me and I, I think are important to the Constitution and important to uh, people who value the law, and that is due process. And whether you know you like the fact that people are re are are requesting asylum protection or not, whether you like it or not, they have the right to do it, and they have the right to due process, and they have the right to have a shot at at fighting their, for their case and fighting for their life. Whether you like it or not, that's how things are, that's how they should be. But under this administration and under policies like MPC, MPP, um, that the whole idea of rule of law on the American side and the whole idea of due process is completely 
has been completely thrown out the window. But I think in, in order to really take a look at this, we've got to take a, a bigger step back. I, I would implore that all of us take a step back and kind of think through um, what is happening in terms of migration. So we've seen a shift in migration happen over the last several years. So, so the fact that families are arriving at our front door, that's nothing new. That's been happening for the last six to seven years when the trends began to change. Um, the difference is we've not changed the way that we approach it as a country. We still pretty much look at everybody who arrives without documents as a criminal. And they're treated in many ways as such or treated as a national security threat. We have real national security threats, to be sure. I have the incredible privilege of serving on the House Armed Services Committee. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've, I've had um, the privilege of, of being in those classified briefings about our national security threats. A mom and her baby is not a national security threat. But having large numbers of asylum seekers or undocumented crossers obviously does present a challenge, right? It, and it is a matter of resources. So let's think about this. If we're going to tackle this, because as I mentioned during um, one of my responses, this has not changed. So the people are still arriving um, and they're going to keep migrating. So until we address the root causes of migration and look at ourselves in the mirror and see what we've done to incentivize migration, you know, the Representative Crenshaw earlier talked about the cartels and the lawlessness in Mexico and, you know, the, 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 the uh, drugs. Well, American citizens are the chief consumers of those drugs, yet we never mention our role in much of what happens in this hemisphere. So it's a matter of leadership that's willing to sit down uh, with other hemispheric leaders to chart out a path to addressing these issues. If we think migration is a challenge now, wait until climate, the climate crisis grows even worse. When people are starving and they're not able to grow food on their land, um, when people are fleeing uh, coastlines that have disappeared and uh, you know the ravages of, of severe fires, how do we address these big challenges together in a collaborative way? Putting up um, you know, policies that are incredibly cruel, whether it be family separation um, or MPP, they're not solving anything. Uh, you know, it may be out of sight and out of mind for the country, but in communities like mine, where we continue to work together and collaborate and see ourselves as one region, um, those problems don't go away just because they're on the other side of the street. So I am very much in favor of working together with hemispheric leaders on long-term solutions, mid-term solutions, short-term solutions. Um, we have to live up to this challenge in a way that doesn't betray our values or our humanity. And I'm afraid that that's, that's what's been happening over the last few years. Thank you. I'm going to go to Representative Crenshaw. And you can answer, you know, anything you want from what, what the Congresswoman just said. But I would also start dropping in some of the questions coming from our audience as we go, um, because we have some interesting questions. One, which goes to something you just said, Congresswoman. Um, Lila Abed and also Maria Fernanda Perez from, Perez from Atlantic Council both ask about the economic pressures in Mexico that could be happening at post-COVID, post, you know, a situation of economic crisis that's going to hit the Mexican economy worse than the U.S., and I would add Central American and other economies as well, um, Venezuela, Nicaragua, other places, um, and are we worried about an, an onslaught of a new um, push of people coming into the United States from, from point south because of this? Um, and there's also a question from Daniela Berge Palomino from the Latin American Working Group about the deportation of migrants to Haiti, Mexico, and Guatemala who have uh, tested positive for COVID-19. So if you want to answer those, Congressman Crenshaw, as well as anything else you want to respond to from, from previous comments. Uh, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll hit a couple things. One, we haven't broken any laws, just in, in response to, to, to what was just said. Um, the MPP program is, is not breaking any laws uh, with respect to a rule of order. It, it just isn't. Uh, courts have upheld it. And um, it, it also just, it just I think from a, from a common sense standpoint, intuitively speaking, 
I, I don't think it is too much to ask that we ask someone to simply wait and go through their due process. They do get due process. To say otherwise is, is also untrue. Um, the, the, that I, I think that is perfectly fair. Um, I still agree wholeheartedly with everything Representative Escobar says about, about, about addressing the sources of these issues to include the incentives that, that people have to come across, whether those are, uh, whether that's uh, drug, drugs or um, you know, business incentives too, um, and, and actually enforcing our laws here in the United States. Uh, fully agree. And um, uh, okay, and then, and then the next question was, um, sorry, the first one, was can, can you just repeat it really quick please who tested positive for COVID 19 who were deported back to other countries no, there was another one there was i don't know anything about that particular oh. story and I'm, I'm not actually sure what the question is so the rising the number one? of mexicans oh, yes. that might come across as well as central americans and people from other parts of the world here and by the way for yeah. anyone out there in the audience oh, okay. um at you can send an email to mexico at wilsoncenter.org or you can tweet to at mexico institute representative crenshaw um yeah it, again on the on the people who tested positive and were deported i'm not sure what the question is attached to that fact um so i'm not sure how to address that the the on the first part of, of course we're concerned we, we should be looking at a looking ahead as to what the possibilities are of mass migration because of the economic downturn in, in mexico or or central america there's also an economic downturn here and what we've seen is that illegal immigration tends to drop drastically when we have enormous unemployment here in the United States. So unclear how the future looks um, with respect to that and um, un un unclear what, what it's gonna look like uh, moving forward. But we will, again, but none of that changes my calculation on, on how we address illegal immigration. I think it might address our, I think economic conditions should inform our policies with respect to legal immigration, okay? It should. It doesn't matter with respect to illegal immigration. Our our standard of law should always be the policy that it should be should be the thing that informs our policy making and our law enforcement. Congresswoman, uh, do you want to address either of the two questions or respond to anything else? So the I do want to um, talk a little bit about the the flights that have been carrying. Um, um, immigrants and, and returning them to countries not their own, to communities not their own. Uh, the, what we've been seeing, and I think this is going to be very important for us in, in terms of trying to stop the COVID-19 um, uh, uh, spread, we really have to examine the policies of the federal government and what we are doing to increase the spread. So in terms of the flights, we are essentially exporting COVID-19 to other countries. What's happening internally within our borders, within ICE uh, detention facilities, is we're seeing an increasing, uh, an alarming increase in positive cases. We're also seeing more and more migrants being shuffled back and forth, which again, isn't just a threat to the migrants. Even if there are folks who don't care about the migrants, that's not my perspective, but you know, I, I, I think we should care about people in our custody, um, but, but we should absolutely care about the people who have to go to work every day and become further exposed and at risk. They then take that risk and that exposure home to their families and into their communities. So, the, you know, I've I've been sounding the alarm for for some time about the federal government not following CDC uh, guidelines within facilities and within some of our own agencies. And if we're going to prevent the spread of COVID-19, we've got to not just um, expect that the states. Uh, put in place their own safeguards, we've got to take a look in the mirror and ask ourselves as a federal government what we're doing to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and what we're doing to prevent the, the, ex, the exporting of it. You know, I detailed um, examples of where it, that's happening, I believe, in the border, uh, at the border as a result of MPP and as a result of the quick expulsions. Um, and, and by the way, those quick expulsions, I do see as a violation of due process. MPP 
um, you know, I, I do see as, as creating a potential health catastrophe, not just for the migrants, but for the Americans who come into contact with them as well. Um, with regard to the economic question, this is where, again, the, the uh, you know, I, I want an administration and a country that's going to assert strategic, thoughtful leadership. There should be a coming together uh, with our neighbor to talk through manufacturing. How are we going to resolve some of these big challenges? We're already taking an enormous economic hit in our country because of COVID-19, but um, you know, the, what the U.S. deems as essential manufacturing or essential business is a little different from what Mexico has identified as essential or non-essential. We should have been working together, and we're doing it at the local and regional level. In the absence of national leadership, we're doing it locally and regionally, trying to work out those um, uh, policies to make sure that, that we don't exacerbate the damage to the economy because we are economically interdependent. Um, and so there has to be much more of that at the highest levels of government. And it, but it, again, in the absence of that, we're doing that at the local level. Thank you. We're going to move towards our, our final question here, and then, then Duncan Wood from the Mexico Institute at the Wilson Center will we'll wrap this up with a few reflections. We've got about 10 minutes left here. Um, and so I want to start with Congressman Crenshaw. I mean, give us a, you know, a 60,000 foot view of what's going to be different after COVID-19. Um, you know, we are coming through, we have a decorated Navy SEAL with a, you know, a Harvard master's degree as well as a member of Congress and a former judge and county commissioner and activist. Here you, you are people with enormous um, perspective on this. What's going to look different in Texas? What's going to look different on the border? What's going to look different in terms of mobility and migration when we get on the other side of this? And is there another side or are we going to be dealing with this crisis, are we going to be living with this for a while and therefore changing our patterns before we can get to another side down the road? Give us that sort of top level view. Where does this affect the border? How does this affect mobility and migration? So, Congressman. Well, I mean, a much more normal existence, um, similar to what we had just a few months ago, is, is what it looks like when we're on truly the other side. But what is the, when is the other side is the question. The other side uh, probably occurs when we have a vaccine and, you know, we worldwide, we just don't see that many cases anymore. And, and much like SARS or MERS, uh, this, this seems to have disappeared. That would be the other side. And, and then we can expect some sort of uh, normalization. And um, but, but we're not even close to that. So what does it look like until then uh, without a vaccine? I think I think the new normal looks something like this. The, the sample testing that I that I talked about in detail earlier. Um, and, and, um, and again, I'm not, I was, I was accused of uh, downplaying testing. That's not at all what I said. I said, we're not talking about it correctly as, as, as leaders. We rarely are talking about it correctly. There's this sort of outcry for more testing, but nobody talks about what it's actually good for. And, I, and we agree on what it's good for. I noticed that. Um, but we, we need to have that. And that regime needs to be local in its implementation. Uh, the federal government is doing its part to increase the manufacturing of that and to increase the supply chain coordination, but it is going to be up to local government to figure out what contact tracing looks like. So in Harris County, it looks like actually uh, having med school students um, be recruited to, to be the ones who implement contact tracing. I think that's a smart policy. That's what we're doing in Houston. And uh, that seems to be a model that can be followed around the country. I think people will be, um, will be, will be uh, told that they should wear masks. Now, I'm going to push back extremely hard, as I just did about an hour ago, against anybody that tries to put a fine or put someone in jail because they're not wearing a mask, especially in an open space. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't be, be uh, promoting the use of, of cloth masks? Yeah, of course we should. I think that's a, a good part of it, especially because of the possibility of asymptomatic carriers. But as usual, you know, some people go too far. Okay, so there's a balance there. I think it looks like businesses figuring out what a plan is to open safely for restaurants maybe that means uh still doing takeout maybe that means simply removing some seating from their restaurant or or pushing everybody towards outdoor seating in texas we've got a lot of outdoor seating because uh well it's hot a lot so um you know we can adapt to that um i think for a longer period of time we might continue to tell our senior citizens and our our our, our most vulnerable population 
uh, what, you know, people with comorbidities that make them more vulnerable to the disease to possibly stay at home longer uh, than we're telling everybody else to stay at home. Okay, so there's, there, there isn't a switch that will occur. There's, I, I don't like this false choice that often gets talked about between staying at home perpetually or people dying. That's not the choice, it never has been. Um, we have long known that the purpose of flattening the curve was to, to basically preserve our healthcare system. It never stops the spread of the disease. We have a virus without a vaccine, you literally cannot stop it. Um, but you can flatten the curve so that we can deal with it effectively. The area under the curve never changes. This is another thing that they don't say enough. And, um, and it leads to, I think, bad public conversations about what we're really dealing with. One thing I have a lot of experience with in the military is risk mitigation. You know, if I wanted to keep all my men safe, I would never let them leave the base, right? But I wouldn't be completing my mission either. And so sometimes when we get shot at, we take a tactical retreat. And after that tactical retreat, we reform, we plan ahead, and then we go back and hit the enemy. This is kind of what we're doing. Our tactical retreat was these stay-at-home orders. They make sense. We weren't quite ready to hit this yet. And we were worried that our hospitals would be overwhelmed. We have to come out of that retreat, and we have to be smart about it. And that looks like, I think, the staged reopening that we're going to be doing in Texas and, um, and that new normal that is associated with that. Congresswoman. Well, you know, the, the, none of us has a crystal ball, and so we don't know what things are going to look like on the other side of this. Um, you know, hopefully uh, we emerge strong and uh, safe and, you know, having learned a number of lessons, but, it, you know, could also be that, that what folks are predicting, what scientists and physicians and experts are predicting, which is another onslaught of this uh, during the cold weather, that may be the case as well. I think what should be happening and what I wish were happening, you know, obviously COVID-19 isn't just impacting the United States of America. It's a global pandemic. And I, um, I, I would love to see the United States lead and pull together um, all of the other great nations that are battling this pandemic as well and to collectively come up with a solution. Um, it, I, I feel like, you know, all that I'm seeing is the, the sort of working in silos. There's communication, obviously, that's happening, but is there strategic leadership that's happening um, coming from the United States, pulling together countries, dealing with this in a comprehensive, collaborative way. No, there's a, a real leadership vacuum there um, uh, where, you know, there's an opportunity to, to really bring the, the greatest minds globally together to solve this together because we're in this together. One of the things that I do hope happens is that each one of us individually um, it does a little bit of, of soul searching and, and is introspective about, you know, just in our own lives, the, the way that we consume, the things we consume. There's a lot of folks who have the luxury of being able to work from home and, and not everybody else does. You know, the other thing this pandemic really has done is expose inequities in not just our country, but in other countries, uh, really expose erosions in the safety net. Um, you know, in many ways, we're trying to uh, uh, preserve a healthcare system that um, has been really challenged um, over the last few years. But I, I do hope that when we come out of this on the other side, and we begin to think about rebuilding our country, that we rebuild it in a sustainable way, that we look at sort of, you know, what a, a different kind of economy might look like. We may need far more healthcare workers in the future than, than we ever had in the past, just as pandemics continue to spread and, and become more mystifying for scientists and more deadly and more viral. Um, and so, you know, what can we do to prepare for the next one? Uh, where can we be reflective on, on our weaknesses as a country, as a globe? Um, what can we do better? And so my hope is, is that however we come out of it on the other side, that we start thinking not just around the next corner, but the corner after that and the corner after that, and that we work more closely with other international leaders. Thank you, Congresswoman and Escobar. We're going to go about three or four minutes over, and it's my distinct pleasure to turn it over to Duncan Wood. Duncan. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks to um, both of the, uh, the representatives. Um, I think that we've heard, obviously, a very lively conversation here. 
and uh, we've heard different perspectives, different approaches, but uh, without being trite at all, I want to point out some common themes that have really come through here. And one is about the interconnectedness, clearly, between Mexico and the United States, something that uh, most people in our audience are already aware of. But I think it's vitally important to stress that at this time. Obviously, we see the interconnectedness of the economy. Just this week, we've heard conversations about the need to keep Mexican factories open so that they can supply vital components to the U.S. Uh, military and defense industry. Um, we've obviously had a number of conversations about the importance of the supply chain, not just for uh, medical devices and medical supplies, but actually just to keep the North American economy going. Um, but I'd like to point out a, 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 a few points here that I think are, 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 cri are critical in the conversation about how we move together as two nations. Number one, um, the Wilson Center has just published a, a short paper on uh, looking at collaboration, cooperation between Mexico and the United States in the face of pandemics and on the broader issue of public health. Um, since uh, the late, uh, since the first decade of this century, we've actually had a, uh, a North American plan for um, animal and pandemic influenza in place that allows for cooperation and collaboration between the North American governments. That I think is being underutilized at this point in time. And certainly coming out of this crisis, we're gonna have to revisit that to see ways in which that can be recovered. So that's uh, uh, to be recovered and to be improved. I think that at this point in time, we really do need to be focusing on those uh, bilateral and multilateral mechanisms that can make things better for everybody. So that's sort of in the immediate moment. Secondly, on migration, we can't forget that Mexico and the United States are an extraordinary period of cooperation on migration right now. Whether or not you agree with the approach on both sides of the border, I think what we've seen is a willingness on the part of both governments to work together to stem the flow of Central American migration, and Mexico has taken it upon itself to participate in the uh, Remain in Mexico uh, program. And uh, I think that's something, that, again, that requires constant uh, revision and to make sure that it's working the best way that it possibly can. Lastly, I would point out that collaboration and cooperation between Mexico and the United States are going to be fundamentally important in the economic recovery. Obviously, in reopening the border and allowing uh, the free flow of, of goods and services of back and forth across the border, um, making sure that we take full advantage of the uh, competitive uh, benefits of a fully integrated North American economy. Um, and lastly, to make sure that we actually have the people that are needed. I say this as a green card holder. I'm somebody who has benefited from the United States uh, openness to the world. And I hope that I contribute something to this, uh, to this country as well. But clearly, we've seen that even though there is going to be a lot of unemployment uh, here in the United States, there are ways in which nations can work together to take advantage of the human capital there that we cannot forget about. Um, in closing, obviously, I'd like to thank once again, Representatives uh, Escobar and Crenshaw. Thank you so much for being willing to be here. Thank you for your frank and open approach to the conversation. Um, at the Wilson Center, and if you'll allow me, Andrew, at MPI, we believe in frank and open dialogue. We think that that is part of the solution to many of the country's problems. Um, thank you, Andrew, to you and your team at MPI. It's a great pleasure to work together with you, as always. And to all of our audience out there, um, good afternoon and, uh, and stay well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you to the members of Congress, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you all. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you, everybody.